Uh, at Software Mill, we mostly, mo for most of the time, only hired meet or senior developers because those were people who you could just send to a client and they would be capable uh, of working just by themselves. We had this idea a couple of uh, times that perhaps, like other companies, we should also hire juniors and then try to mentor them somehow. Uh, but actually, every time we thought about this, we had like at least two strong reasons why we shouldn't be doing that. The first reason was that we thought that, hey, they are going to need constant attention. Uh, at Software Mill, we are remote, we don't have an office, and we thought that like mentoring people without sitting with them at the same desk is just not going to work. Because those people still need you, they, st they always need the mentor, they always need someone to just sit with them and help them. The other reason uh, why we thought it wouldn't work uh, was that for, ma for mentors, for people who are actually teaching, this would be a full-time job. And uh, at our company, most of the people, like almost everyone, was working for a client, and then we would need to take someone out from a project, like so leave the client, and then make them teach the junior developers. So we would need to sacrifice someone's work, we would need to sacrifice the money, because this would be an investment, business-wise. But actually, at some point, it was the Scala job market that uh, forced us to reconsider this. Uh, because uh, there was a point at the Scala job market that it was almost saturated. Every good Scala developer already had a job. They were not willing to change. So the only way to actually have some good Scala developers, new Scala developers on board, uh, was to train them yourselves. My name is Jacek Kunicki. I work at Software Mill, where I write Scala and also teach Scala and functional programming. Mm, and uh, the other person in this picture is uh, my friend Michał, whose uh, Software Mill Academy was the initial idea. Uh, we both had some experience at Software Mill in teaching other people Scala. I had my Scala basics training, uh, Michał had a similar one. And it was in autumn 2021 that we decided to join forces and to, act to actually try to mentor junior developers and see what we can do together. Uh, so I'm going to start by explaining why we did this. And uh, then I will take you through the journey, uh, how we did this, whether it worked. Well, you already know that it worked because you saw the title of the presentation, but bear with me. Mm, yeah, so the first reason I already mentioned was the saturated job market. Uh, the other thing was that if we wanted to, uh, we wanted to teach people the skills that we actually require. So most of our Scala projects uh, by that time and now uh, are using the uh, type level stack. This is like a, a popular set of libraries that you can use for functional programming in Scala. Uh, and we wanted to teach people exactly the skills that they are like most probably to go going to use when they are going to work for a commercial project. Uh, as I said, we already had experience with uh, doing stuff uh, by ourselves, like both uh, I and uh, Michal taught people Scala at Software Mill. Uh, when we joined forces, we wanted to st first start with uh, trying to level the knowledge that we have internally at Software Mill. So we took existing employees, asked whether they need some Scala trainings, and then we prepared those. Uh, we also came outside, so we, uh, we organized uh, a meeting, uh, I think it was with v uh, Wrocław Jack, that uh, this, this was a training that you saw in the picture that uh, was called from Java to Scala. And this was an uh, introductory training, intro introduction to Scala for people who, who have been coding Java so far. The next step for us, like once we saw this was working, was actually try to break this, uh, this status quo that we had so far, that we won't be able to, to mentor junior people and to men mentor them remotely, and actually try this. So we had this experience with doing this, this internally, it seems that uh, it, it could work, so we decided to try. Sorry. Uh, and uh, so this is, this is how uh, the Scala Academy was born for, for junior developers. And first, like before we could do this, we needed people who, who we would be working with, so the junior developers. We had a couple of rules in mind that we wanted to apply to this kind of training. First of all, we wanted those people to be regular uh, contractors or employees at, at Software Mill. So they were like no different than any other employee at Software Mill. They were part of the team. This was no apprenticeship. This was no trial period. They were just regular employees at Software Mill who like worked on with us on their dedicated project, which was Software Mill Academy. They took part with all the other activities, so they were like first-class citizens at Software Mill. 
The other thing is that uh, we didn't want them to sign any loyalty agreements. And this, this was actually pretty controversial when I discussed Software Mill Academy with, uh, with some people. They were like, hey, how can you like, hire junior developers without signing any loyalty agreements? You're basically going to train employees for another company because they are going to receive the training from you, then they are going to leave and they are going to work for other company and your money is lost. Well, this is true, but uh, and this is a risk, and we were aware of this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we didn't want uh, to keep people at, uh, at Software Mill that would only stay there after the academy because they have a loyalty agreement signed. So for us, it was like we, we knew the risk, we took it, but we were like pretty, we were pretty sure that uh, the way we are going to teach them uh, would make them want to stay here, basically. If we show them how we work, how we teach, and how, how software is working. And fortunately, this worked. Uh, the last rule that uh, we actually a bit failed to communicate clearly uh, to the junior developers was that the Software Academy was not a contest. Because there were many, m many points at time where they thought that like, they, they need to perform very well because uh, that we are going to fire some of them after the academy, like those who performed uh, like on, on the lowest level. And we kept telling them that this is not a context, that the assumption is that everyone is staying after the academy. But they were like, I, I don't know if they were not able to believe this or, or what was the reason, but we got the feedback very often that th this was not clear for them. And they thought that like they must do their best, otherwise they are going to be fired. So this was for the rules. Uh, for the hiring process itself, well, we already had some experience uh, with hiring people because so we've been hiring people remotely for, for a couple of years by that time. So we, we knew how to do it. However, for the Software Academy hiring, we wanted to simplify this a bit. So uh, this pr hiring process had three steps. The first one was a pre-screening call to basically see whether there is a match and like where the vibe is there. Uh, the other one was a very simple dev skiller. The goal of the dev skiller was that we wanted to, to hire people who knew at least something about Java. So the dev skiller was basically a sieve to, uh, to tell people, to tell apart people who know something about Java and who don't. Uh, and then we had a, uh, a technical interview. So our key assumption was that we wanted to start the training with people on a quite similar level. Actually, we didn't know upfront what this level would be, like whether we are going uh, to end up with a group of people who like barely know Java, although they needed to, do, to know something to pass the dev skiller, or uh, whether we are going to, to end up with people who, who know something and they are like juniors, but with, uh, with a bro quite a broad knowledge for a junior. I think this is broken because there sh should be something here. Shall I unplug it here and try again? Or Okay, we are back. Uh, for this reason, like for, uh, for having the people with, with similar skills, uh, we decided to ask everyone the same questions during the technical interview. And this was because uh, it was then easier for us to, to compare the answers to see how much, uh, how much those people knew and, uh, and like how, how they compared to each other. Uh, the questions we asked were rather open and rather, rather cross-cutting. So this wasn't th 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 those questions weren't very specific about a specific technology. The reason was that mm, I would argue that if you uh, that interviewing junior developers is much more difficult than interviewing a, as a candidate for a senior or, or mid, because if you if you have a candidate for a senior, you basically assume that they should know almost everything that you are asking them about. And then when you hire a junior developer, it's it's a bit more tricky because. The assumption is that they won't know things because they are they come here for you to teach them. So you need to be careful like asking the questions, evaluating the answers. In our case, we, we, we try to ask to, to ask some very, very open questions and to basically see how far we can get. Uh, the two example questions that we that we asked during those interviews, uh, well, the first one was about uh, about a map and keys in a map. Like the the question was, how would you what properties should a class have that can be used as a key in a hash map? And then starting from this, you can talk uh, talk and discuss a lot of different topics. This could be immutability. This could be the internals of how a hash map works. 
uh, the the optimi- like the the cost of uh, looking up a key, the cost of putting a key, the collisions. So you name it, basically. And uh, we told them up front that we don't n- expect them to answer, to know everything. Like we, we, we just want to hear like what, what their intuition is, what they know so far. And then we basically tried to, to see how much we can get with this question. Uh, the other question was a very general one about databases. And the question was like, uh, uh, why at all did humanity uh, invent NoSQL databases? So like what was wrong with SQL that people decided that they need NoSQL? And here, there, uh, again, this is, this is a very open question. Like you can see whether they know anything about relational databases and what the, uh, what the differences are with not, not relational databases, what are, the, what are the drawbacks, what are the compromises. I think once we even get to the, to the CAP theorem, so this was like pretty good for a junior developer to, to, to know that, but this was not the expectation, again. The expectation was to just hear the, li- listen to the people, uh, see what, what they know, and then try to, try to see where, uh, where they belong. In the, in the level of their knowledge. So after we hired them, uh, it, the time came for the, for the training itself. The training was planned for three months and uh, for the first edition of Software Mill Academy, this was just a guess. Like we thought like three months, it it's like, sounds good. We'll see how it goes, basically. There were two mentors. There was uh, like, I, I took part in both the editions uh, and there, there were another mentor doing this, uh, doing this with me. And there were four mentees. And you can ask, why four? Well, it's a, it's a good number. It was a guess, basically. Uh, our first assumption was that uh, we want a small team to, see, to just see how it works. Because especially during the first edition, we, we didn't know how it is going to work. Uh, another thing to consider is the business risk of having uh, four junior developers. Because after they finish the academy, you need to do something with them. And then you are, uh, and it's it's not that, that easy to sell a junior developer to a client because they still need some assistance. So the the business risk that we took there was that we will have uh, four people without the project who, and and we told them that we are not going to fire them after the academy, even if they don't get a project, because this was also one of the rules that no one got fired by default. So uh, th- this was a challenge, and we decided that, like, well, f- okay, four people is the, like a good number to see it whether whether it's going to work or not, and we can take the risk. We could take the risk at that point of having far- four people possibly without a project. The training itself uh, consisted of uh, a theoretical introduction, and this was uh, the Scala Basics course that we did together. So this was like a Scala introduction to Scala for Java developers. And then there was an intro to functional programming, which was a pretty deep, d- deep dive, and uh, like you're jumping in a very, very, very deep water. And we knew that, like we, we got the feedback that it's like p- quite difficult, but we knew that we wanted to try. Uh, the lectures were interactive, so it's not like I was uh, standing bef- in front of them, like here, and just like talking for half a day about Scala and functional programming, because this wouldn't work. This was a lecture that was actually interleaved with, uh, with exercises, or actually exercises interleaved by a lecture. So we wanted those people to do as much as possible on uh, their own. Initially, we wanted to encourage them, but then after some time, they noticed that we actually don't bite, and it's, it, it's okay to like just go do the exercise, think aloud. So that was fine. Then there was the practical part, uh, which was uh, working on a, on, on a specific app. So in, in, the, in, in the theoretical introduction, this was like more tutorial-like, but then in the, in the practical part, uh, they had an apl- application to implement, which consisted of a couple of microservices that, that communicated. Like the domain is not really important here, but the important thing here is that they had an actual project to work on. And this was the point where uh, we, the mentors, uh, got a second role, actually, because apart from being the mentors, we are also the business or the client for the, for the developers, for the juniors. Uh, we did our best not to be a difficult client, uh, but sometimes we were. And this was, for example, because we were busy with, uh, with uh, working in other projects for, for our clients. And sometimes it happened that we simply didn't have time for the junior developers and they, they needed to wait. They asked us questions, we didn't have time to respond. So this was like uh, not so on purpose, but a, a simulation of working with a, with a difficult client. So what did the training look like? Our main motto 
and this is kind of philosophical one, is that the journey was much more important than the goal. So uh, we had uh, we had an idea what the what the final application should look like, what the what the features should be. But uh, the thing that we wanted to focus on was the learning process. So the journey that the junior developers were were going through, and to actually learn them something without the main goal being uh, like having all the tasks in Jira done. So this was not the not the main requirement. We made some of the tasks uh, described uh, imprecisely on purpose, and this was because uh, we were the client and we wanted them to do some kind of analysis as well, so go through the tasks that they had in Jira and then ask us questions to clarify. So this was actually part of the plan. And then, like again, keeping in mind our motto that the journey is most, most the most important part, uh, we did some uh, simplifications and overcomplications. So the simplified part was the business requirements because uh, it very often happened that we uh, dropped some business requirement because, uh, for, for example, some kind of consistency of, of, or, or things like that because it was not important. Like it, it, it would be important if they worked in a real system, but in this case, uh, in, in the process of teaching, it wasn't really uh, that important. On the other hand, we tried to overcomplicate the technical requirements. Uh, although the application was very simple, because those were microservices that were communicating, and uh, initially we only had gRPC, so like a, a sync, in, in meaning like request-response communication. But then to make things complicated and to make them learn another approach, another tool, we also wanted to introduce some message-driven communication. Actually, we asked them to just use Kafka for some, some of the services to communicate. And we also asked them to use uh, some other non-relational database because for uh, for for the main uh, for the main database we, we had something like a user service which we have in almost every application. The user service was using a PostgreSQL, I think, so a relational database. But to make things more complex, although it wasn't really necessary, so we told them that they, we in a in such a small system you, we wouldn't probably do it in real life. But here we are asking them to choose. Uh, choose an area of the application that can use a no rela non-relational database. And I think in uh, in one of the editions it was MongoDB, and in in the other one I think it was Redis. But this was like a, f a forced technical requirement to just make stuff more complex. Uh, what did it look like in terms of how the work was organized? So we didn't have any formal process like a Scrum or Kanban. We had a task board in, in Jira, but as I, as I said, like the tasks were not the most important part. They were there to define the, uh, the requirements more or less precisely. But then we, we had daily stand-ups because we like focused on, on good communication. But this was like a, a very flexible thing. One of the things that uh, I think were the most important part of the, the, the process of how the juniors work together and this was actually also one of the reasons why there were four developers, because four is an even number, uh, was that we wanted to them to work in pairs from the very beginning. And uh, if you hear about pair programming, like the initial impression might be that this is a waste of time because like those people could be doing separate tasks, uh, uh, but then when they are working together, they are actually wasting their time and your time, basically. But here it was not the case, actually, and because they were learning. And uh, for us, the, the idea of uh, asking them to, to work in pairs from the very beginning was, uh, first of all, to uh, learn uh, them how to communicate effectively uh, be between them. Like, every one of you probably know when, when you need to use uh, this yellow rubber duck, and the, 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 like, the most difficult part of solving a problem is actually defining it. So this was the part when we wanted them to be able to define the problem, to first discuss them like in the pair, and then if they still don't know the solution, then come ask us. This taught them another important thing, uh, which is uh, like w w where is the threshold when you need to ask for help? Because it's easy like to spend a week working on a task when you actually don't have an idea what you are doing. Mm, but then it's, it, it might be too long. So you, you need to know where this thin line is, whether you should still continue working on a task yourself or actually come and ask for help. So this is another thing that we wanted to teach them as well. And since there were four of them and they were working in pairs, we, were, we kept uh, switching the pairs so that like everyone had the chance to work with, uh, with someone else. Actually, the level of knowledge was, uh, uh, al although we tried to make it as even as possible from the, from the very beginning, uh, like we could see that there were, for example, two people that uh, like, uh, were better, so to say, uh, two there were that have like, lower capabilities and lo lower knowledge, so we also wanted to mix them so that everyone has a chance to work with, with someone else. 
And I think this worked pretty well. The other thing was uh, regular communication. So apart from the, from the daily stand-ups that we had, we also wanted to get uh, instant and uh, regular feedback. So es especially we as the mentors wanted to know if something isn't working. Because we saw that, yeah, okay, it was working in general, but we wanted uh, to know how, how we could improve. Mm, and uh, the thing we wanted to convince them about is that we, the mentors, are also humans and we are making mistakes too, and we want them to tell us about the mistakes because, yeah, we want to improve this as well. So this was about the, the, the process itself, and now let me tell you a, a bit about the mentoring process itself, so what the knowledge transfer process looks like. The first thing is that instead of giving them answers when they had questions, we kept answering them with another questions. So this, and, and the, the idea of that was, uh, like try to make them think, uh, try to like navigate them, try to direct them and what the answer might be, but not giving them the answers directly, because this, uh, th this just wouldn't work. We wanted them to be able to explore, to, to also learn like how, how, they, how can they think, how can they look for answers. Uh, a very important thing when you are mentoring other people is that you don't make them feel dumb. Because the thing that you need to remember while being a mentor is that it's uh, not about showing that you know. Because the, those junior developers, they know that you know. They came there, you are, the, you are their mentor, you are, you are teaching them, they know that you have the knowledge. But instead of showing them like, hey, and telling them, hey, I know it, you don't know it, you rather need to act to, 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 so that they know that you know, so that they, they treat you as, as, as a mentor, so that, you, yeah, so, 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 so that you basically have this kind of respect from them. But it's not about, uh, you are not doing this by telling them that they are stupid, they don't know, know anything, and you know everything, because they know it up front. Another very important factor and this was one of the main challenges uh, during the, the two editions of, uh, of Software Mill Academy, uh, was code review. Code review in this practical part, uh, when they were working on, on their application, was the main source of knowledge for them. Uh, and this was, so this, th this needed to be, to be very solid, because like, we needed to focus on it very, very much in order to be able to pass the knowledge to them. I had this teacher in, back in high school who had a very, mm, very special grading system. Uh, and w w when we were given some text assignments, this was from the, like, the Polish classes, we were given text assignments. And of course, she was doing like the, the grammar checks, the spelling checks, stuff like that. And uh, whenever you make uh, the same mistake again in another like writing assignment, you got a one, so the lowest note for, for the term, basically. And this was a very brutal way to try to teach us uh, not to make the same mistakes twice. Uh, our goal at Academy was the same, although the implementation was not that brutal, so we didn't fire anyone uh, by, because of making another the, the same mistake twice. Uh, but this was very important, so we wanted them to like, read the comments we give them in the code review and, and learn from them, so that no, they know how to apply this knowledge like, further down the road. Uh, the important thing about doing the code review is that is you, you, sh you, shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't say that they should do something because you said so. So again, they, this is similar to raising children. So if you want a child to do something, they should understand why they are doing it. And with developers, it's, it's, it's the same. Like if, they, if, 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 if you explain them why you expect them to do this, to this in, in that way, this would, ha this would have much better effect than just telling them, hey, I'm the senior here, you are the junior, do what I say. That's not going to work. And obviously, the junior developers were making a lot of mistakes, especially in the initial phase. So it's actually interesting how the, how the mistakes they were making evolved over time, because initially, of course, they were very trivial mistakes from the perspective of a, of a mm, senior developer. So like, those are things that were obvious for me, but I needed to like, explain why they are obvious and why should they shouldn't be doing this way. Over time, they evolved to, to some, some more complex, more subtle mistakes. So this was actually also more challenging for us to, like, to be uh, able to explain all these subtleties. One tool that uh, proved uh, to be very useful while doing the code review, and I learned about this tool in the, only in the second edition of Academy, uh, was a framework, so to say, it's called conventional comments. And it's basically a way to structure your comments in the pull request. 
The main thing, uh, the main way it helps is that you need to put your comment in one of the categories and basically you m at the very beginning you need to make a decision yourself whether this comment is blocking or not. So whether this prevents the pull request from being merged or is it like a nice to have but then that can be done later, for example. And by, by triaging those, uh, especially when you see a lot, a lot of issues at the with the code at the very beginning, by answering yourself the question whether this is actually a blocker or not, this is very helpful. Because initially, when you see a code base with a lot of mistakes, your first thought is like, throw it away, write it again, I'll tell you how. But that's, that, that, that's not going to work again. So basically, that, that, that there's a lot of things you want, to, you want to teach them, but you need to decide which, uh, which of them are the most important ones. And actually, I then started using the, con the conventional comments. Uh, you, can, you can find it in, I think, conventional.comments.org or something like that. I, stuck, I started using it in like normal projects when working with normal clients and it, this was really helpful because like it really helps you with gaining the right perspective when doing the code review. Sometimes uh, when doing the code review I ended up writing lar large pieces of text and it, f f and s and it happened that uh, when I ended up writing like a screen uh, worth of, uh, of a comment with some code examples with trying to say why I would do this another way, how you could do this using the, the libraries you have. Uh, I actually ended up with turning the code review into something I call the micro lecture. And the micro lecture was basically uh, isolating the problem, isolating the thing I wanted to show them, how, to, how this could be solved. And then basically meeting with them and, and explaining why I would do this. And uh, I, uh, the reason was I found it like too long for a, for, for a piece of writing. Well, I, w I was able to write it, but I had this feeling that, hey, perhaps it's too long. Maybe you like, let's just go meet with those people and explain why we would it, uh, do it like that. And then you also have this uh, like interactive experience because they can ask questions. You can like play it with the code together and, and show them why would you do it like this. Of course, we had a lot of challenges. So the first challenge that we had, actually before we started with the academy, uh, this was already solved, but uh, we needed to solve this before the second edition, was, uh, was finding the mentors. The problem with finding the mentors, like there are a couple of issues here, uh, one of them is that uh, having the knowledge is not enough, because passing the knowledge to other people is really much more difficult, than just like uh, using it in a project, for example, when you, when you work for a client. Uh, the reason is that not, not everyone uh, can do this, because this is like a, a thing you need to learn, or like be a born, natural born teacher. And even if someone knows how to do it, not everyone wants. So it's not enough to have a lot of senior de developers on board in your company. It's also like uh, being able to pick the people who would like to, do, to, to teach and who would be capable of doing this. Another problem with uh, teaching, about, uh, apart from being a senior developer, is that uh, actually I think uh, like uh, being able to teach a topic is the highest possible level of seniority in that topic. Because you might be a senior uh, Scala, senior Java engineer, you're like, you, know, you know everything, but then it turns out that if you, if you need to explain that to people, especially to people who have never seen the topic before, then they start asking you questions that seem trivial, but then you want to give them the, uh, the right answer. And it turns out that you actually don't know why something is working like that. Yeah, like you know it's working because you've been using I don't know this library, this construct in code for, for forever, and you, you know it should be done this way. But if you need to explain this to someone and to answer the very basic question of why, why are we doing this this way, it turns out that it's a it, it's a it's a big challenge. So once you have the mentors, uh, of course you need your time. The issue that we had with, uh, with the, our engagement in Software <laughs> Academy, because as I mentioned, we, we tried to work on, on different projects in the meantime, was that the engagement uh, the required from us was varying over time. Initially, when in this, in this theoretical phase where, you, where we had the lectures, this was pretty easy to plan, because like, we, can, we, we had a schedule like, uh, written for a week or two, when, which lecture is when, and then you know how much time this requires. Not always, because sometimes uh, like we were giving them homeworks, we needed to discuss the home to those homeworks, and then it starts getting unpredictable. But then, in this, uh, in this practical phase, when they started to writing their code, and we needed to review it, um, this, this uh, was much more challenging, 
because like you never knew when they were going to make a PR, when you would need to review it. As, a, as I said, we didn't want to play a difficult client on purpose, so we didn't want to delay things on purpose, but sometimes it happened that, that we did, and sometimes they needed to wait for a review, they needed to wait for, for answers to their questions. So uh, this, this, this was difficult, and uh, the most difficult part, as I said, is that this changes over time and you cannot really predict. So it's not like you can uh, you can dedicate every Friday to work on Software Remote Academy, for example. You need to dedicate like a random hour every day, and you are not you, you you don't know how how long it's going to take when it's going to happen. And of course, the uh, the other challenge here is context switching. So if you are the, the the more things you are doing in parallel, the more expensive the context switching is. So if you if you work for a client or for um, or anything else, then you need to switch to the code review. It takes time. Uh, speaking of code review, uh, it was actually one of the main challenges for, for me. Uh, first of all, as I said, uh, this was the main source of knowledge for them. So you needed to, to, do this, uh, to do this in a very, very solid fashion. And the problem is that, as with everything, uh, there is the risk of burning out. And I was burnt out at the, like, towards the end, towards the, like, the third month of the Software Academy, because like, I... I, I, I I didn't want to write the long comments. Sometimes I, I like it was very tempting to just approve the PR because like I, I knew they've already learned a lot of stuff. Like th they, they made some mistake. I should have commented on that, but this was like tempting to just, just press approve. I didn't do it, but uh, because like then every time I told myself, hey, like you are the mentor here, you need to teach them. The only way to teach them is to actually explain. If I just approve the PR, well, again, well, it, it's going to be merged, but they are not going to learn. Maybe an important piece of the, what they were about to learn. But this was very hard, and uh, in, in, in both editions, this was the, the greatest challenge for me. Like in, in the second edition, I already know that it, uh, it would be approaching, so I was like prepared for this, and I, needed, I, I knew that I, I need to be strong <laughs> towards the very end and like do, do, this, do this properly. Uh, one thing that we missed in the first edition of Software Mill Academy was uh, the infrastructure, because the, the junior developers were, were writing their code, but then uh, it turned out towards the end that there is no place to deploy it, and that when, when they were doing the demo, this was actually running on someone's, uh, someone's laptop. Uh, we were able to fix it in the, in the second edition of, uh, of Academy, uh, because we cooperated with uh, another initiative at Software Mill called DevOps Academy. So uh, actually, we had, uh, we, we, we had uh, by that time, we had a DevOps, DevOps department and we had junior DevOps engineers who were also le learning. So we joined forces and we had junior Scala developers who were writing uh, the application and producing Docker images. And then we had the, the DevOps Academy uh, who were was preparing the infrastructure. And also, like they, they had their, their own curriculum, they had their own way of, uh, of working, but we were able to, to join forces, and uh, I think it worked pretty nice. Last but not least, uh, the training itself, so the three months, is just the beginning. So this is a very important factor that we needed to be aware of. And after the developers, the junior developers, finish the, the Scala Academy, they cannot be left alone, because they would be joining a project for working for a real client, but then their future team lead needs to be made aware of the fact that they will have junior developers on board who still need mentoring, who still need some guidance. Because like there is no magic in Software Academy. We were able to give them the knowledge, but we are not really able to give them a lot of experience through the three months. And the experience is the next thing they needed to gain uh, by working on a real project. So uh, everyone, uh, including us, needed to be aware of that. Uh, initially, like this was a surprise for us because we felt like, okay, we, we did our job, the academy is done, here are four developers, like just use them. Uh, but this was not that simple. Uh, to sum this up, well, it worked. And uh, I think it worked pretty nicely. Uh, we did this two times, so of course, after the first edition, we, we had uh, a, lo a lot of experience. Uh, perhaps there would be yet another edition of, uh, of that. Mm, of course, the academy wasn't perfect, so uh, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but as I said, since we we insisted on uh, on, on giving on gaining regular feedback, uh, we know what to improve, and we were improving on the fly. Uh, we had a retrospective every month, so and we like we tried to talk honestly with uh, with all the junior developers. 
and I think this was pretty uh, pretty effective. And I think that uh, apart from being able to teach them Scala and functional programming, we are also able to teach them something like the, the company culture, the way we work, the way we exchange feedback. So this was a good thing, actually. Uh, it was also nice that we were able to join forces with the DevOps Academy. Actually, for some of the next editions, we are also considering joining forces with some kind of front-end academy, because for, uh, for now, this was a back-end system that uh, just has some kind of uh, REST API that they were using, so all the demo was, uh, was done during Postman or anything like that. Uh, we already joined with DevOps Academy. Perhaps it would, would be a good idea to take the front-end team and then have like one huge academy, like a full-stack academy. Maybe it's a good name. I just made it up now. <laughs> Mm. And business-wise, because uh, as I said, this is a business risk. So you have uh, you, you you finish the academy after three months. You had four junior developers that still need assistance. They still need mentoring, and you need to sell them to a client. And uh, one thing that we were actually not uh, we we didn't know that upfront is when this is going to pay off because it cost our time. It cost the, the time of the junior developers. But then we did the math afterwards, and it turned out that uh, when, you w when you sell all of them to some kind of project, and when they work for three months for a, cli for a real client, it's paying off. So it was pretty nice, because uh, actually it was a nice surprise, because we were expecting something like half a year or anything like that, and three months was actually a very, very nice number. And as I said, we get, uh, we get uh, a lot of uh, nice feedback. We learned a lot ourselves. I think one of the important things that we were able to uh, to teach the, the developers uh, when it comes to giving feedback uh, is that uh, they uh, they were able th they were telling us the truth. So basically, they, they were honest and they they were not afraid that the, we told them that they are not going to get like lower marks or grades or anything like that because they they criticize. We actually encouraged them to criticize, and our success was that we convinced them that they are free to criticize and that the critique is welcome. So this was a, a great thing. So this is the point where I'll be more than happy to hear any questions or comments that you might have. If some of you did anything like this at your company, I'll be very happy to hear that we did everything wrong and how we could improve, for example.